Good afternoon. Welcome to the Washington History Seminar. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us and welcome you to this afternoon's uh, or evening's, in Anne's case, a session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs with Pulitzer Prize winning historian and journalist Anne Applebaum, author of The Twilight of Democracy, The Seductive Lure of Authoritarianism. My name is Christian Osterman. I direct the Wilson Center's History and Public, Public Policy Program, and I co-chair the Washington History Seminar with Eric Arneson, director of the National History Center. It's good to have you all with us. A special thanks to uh, Center President Jane Harmon, and of course, Anne Applebaum, who is in Europe, as I just mentioned, where the hour is rather late. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative effort of two organizations, the Wilson Center and the National History Center of the American Historical Association, a series that has become an institution of its own in Washington, now in its 10th year, that brings together, uh, in, into the, brings into the Washington conversation, leading historians from around the world and the country. We usually hold these events in person at the Wilson Center, but as many uh, as many others, we have moved to the virtual space and it's been exciting, exciting because we've been able to reach a much broader audience. There are close to, I think, a thousand viewers on Zoom and Facebook Live this afternoon. Before I call on Congresswoman Jane Harmon, president of the center, to make a few remarks, let me thank our sponsors and partners, the LePage Center for History, in the public interest at Villanova University, as well as the George Washington University History Department. Thank them for their financial support. And we want to thank a number of anonymous donors who make these meetings possible. We welcome contributions from any of you in the audience. And there's actually a donation information in the chat um, function if you're interested in supporting this effort. Behind the scenes, there are two individuals we need to thank, Rachel Wheatley, the Assistant Director of the National History Center, and Piet Bierstecker on my team. Uh, let me just briefly go over some logistics. After introductions and Anne's remarks, we will have a Q&A. If you're watching on Zoom and would like to ask the question, please uh, click the raise hand button. Once you press the button, you will be entered into a queue which only the moderators can view. When the moderator calls on you, you will receive a prompt that will ask you to unmute your screen. Please press the yes button and you'll be able to talk and ask your question, short questions. Once you have asked your question, you will be muted again. If you would like to ask another question, you'll unfortunately have to get in line again. Uh, so raise your hand again. You may also submit questions to Rachel Wheatley via the email provided in the chat function. And if you're watching us on Facebook Live, feel free to post your question in the comment function. We apologize in advance for all of those who we can't call on. We'll just, uh, we have just an hour for this event. With that, let me call on Jane Harmon for her remarks and then to, on Eric to introduce Anne. Jane, the room is yours. Thank you, Christian. Uh, as, he, as Christian said, I'm Jane Harmon, the president and CEO of the Wilson Center, a recovering politician. Uh, just like Ann's husband, Raddick. Uh, I spent uh, nine terms in the Congress. He had a bigger job, but hey, we're, we're all friends. And when uh, I learned that uh, this week would be a focus on Ann's new book, I asked uh, to participate because uh, when I want to know what I think about an issue, there are two women I listen carefully to. Uh, one is Robin Wright, whom you may know, who is a part-time consultant to the Wilson Center, a New Yorker writer, and the other is Anne Applebaum. I think her writing is splendid, and I usually finish her op-eds or whatever she has written saying, I agree with that. I wish I had thought of that. So I'm going to agree with her book. I wish I had thought of her book. And let me just make a few remarks about uh, the book and Anne. Uh, long before the world was convulsed with this pandemic, hopefully not another one in the near future, and before Western democracy struggled to muster an effective COVID-19 response, uh, uh, paren, hopefully they will, uh, democracies around the globe have been on a dangerous backslide. Authoritarianism 
as my social media adept grandkids would say, is trending. Many essays, books, and studies have tried to explain the lure of authoritarianism and why governments in 2020 function more like they did 100 years ago than they did 10 years ago, um, but um, they have not been successful. This book uh, takes us uh, to a new place that we haven't really thought deeply about. That's why I think Anne is so cool, because she thinks about stuff I wouldn't think about. Uh, she, Anne, is, an, is a social history buff, Atlantic staff writer, Pulitzer Prize winner, and has spoken and written for the Wilson Center uh, more often than most. Uh, and here's her take. While other accounts of democratic backsliding focus on wily politicians uh, or non-politicians and the aggrieved mobs that propel them to success, Anne's take is centered on academics bureaucrats, media figures, and political strategists who use their brains and talent to enable an autocrat's ascent to power. Got that, folks? I gotta mention the, the crowd again because you're all in one of these boxes. Academics, bureaucrats, media figures, and political strategists. That kind of covers everybody on this call, I, I, I think. Uh-oh. Uh, to borrow another analogy from social media, the fastest way to, to start a trend is with the help of influencers who hold powerful sway over the opinions of their large followings. These influencers, whom what Anne calls clerks, it's spelled clerks, but it's pronounced clerks, I just learned because I asked her, and that's the French uh, pronunciation, channel nostalgia for a simpler past, warn of existential threats to society, and propagate wild conspiracy theories. Sound familiar? Mm. Then undermine trust in government, preparing the ground for an illiberal leader to gain power and weaponize that fear and distrust. Not that fear wasn't a weapon before, but this is on steroids. Uh, but what motivates these scholars, journalists, and civil servants? Is it a desire for power or a genuine belief that less democracy is better? Anne needs to explain this because I'll mess it up. And anyway, she's the one who has the explanation that we need to hear. Uh, as Christian mentioned, today's discussion is part of the Washington History Seminar, which is an ongoing weekly series co-sponsored by the Wilson Center's a History and Public Policy Program, aka HAP, and the American Historical Association's National History Center. And uh, I uh, am delighted now to turn uh, the microphone over and the Zoom uh, photo, here he is, there he is, to the National History Center's uh, Eric Arneson, who is uh, uh, next up and will give an even better, although I thought mine wasn't bad, introduction of Anne. Over Thank to you, Eric. Thank you, Jane. That was a very good introduction, but I get to go into just a tad more detail very briefly. Over the course of her career, Anne Applebaum has been the foreign and deputy editor uh, of the Spectator magazine in London, the political editor of the Evening Standard, a columnist for Slate, a longtime yes. columnist for the Washington Post, and she's currently staff writer for the Atlantic magazine. In addition, she also happens to be an historian whose book, Gulag, a History, won the 2004 Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction. Her Iron Curtain, The Crushing of Eastern Europe, 1944 to 1956, won the Kundal Prize uh, for Historical Literature and the Duke of Westminster Medal, and her Red Famine, Stalin's War on Ukraine, received both the Lionel Gelber Prize as well as the Duff Cooper Prize in 2018. She also happens to be the co-author of a cookbook from a Polish country house kitchen. So cool. Indeed. This afternoon, well, for us, uh, for Anne, it's quite late in the evening. She will be speaking about her latest book, The Twilight of Democracy, The Seductive Lore of Authoritarianism. Anne, the screen is yours. Um, so thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Jane, for those kind words. And thank you also, Eric. And it's delighted to be there, delighted to be with you, you know, spiritually or virtually or whatever I am, even though, even though not <laughs> Um, you know, it's, I, I'm sure there are a lot of friends on this call. The Wilson Institute, the Wilson Center is a great institution. Um, so the, the book is, um, you know, in a way, um, doesn't lend itself to traditional academic formats, um, you know, lectures and heavy debate and so on, um, because it's really not an academic book. 
Um, and since this is a history seminar, maybe I should say, talk a little bit about why I wrote it or what inspired me to write it. Um, all of my previous books, my, my, my pre other than not, not counting the cookbook actually, but, um, but my, my previous history books were all attempts to write about, um, they, were, they were big events. There was a, I wrote a history of the Gulag, I wrote a history of the Sovietization of Eastern Europe after the Second World War. Um, I, I wrote a history of the Ukrainian famine, and all of those books were about big, mostly tragic historic events, and then they were about how people perceived them. Um, and so there were always a lot of characters in the book, but, you know, both leaders and ordinary people, and I, I made a great effort to show events from many perspectives. Um, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, I realized that I had myself lived through some big historical events and including some that were still unfolding um, and that they these events had changed my life and altered the way that i perceived things and i perceived my my country but also my relationships with other people too and i thought it would be interesting to try and write a book which instead of searching for some kind of objectivity instead of telling the story from many perspectives that would just tell it from my perspective um, and so this book is different from my previous history books, although it has, I mean, it has some of the same sensibility. I'm interested in some of the same themes, um, but it's just my point of view and I don't really pretend otherwise. I mean, it is, uh, it is, it is my biased kind of, you know, my view of the last 20 years of history. And on, as Jane said, only on a certain slice of it, on the people that I know and who I can therefore write about. Um, and it's about the, the, the end of what was a kind of coalition. It was a coalition, not a kind of a coalition. Um, and that was the coalition that you could have described in different countries using slightly different language, but you could have described as the center right, in the US maybe as the Reaganite right, in Britain as Thatcherites, um, in Poland, Pravica was the word, you know, the kind of anti-communists. Um, and these were people who, in the 1980s and the 1990s, were lined up you know, together and who together um, were part of the reason why communism collapsed in 1989. They weren't the only reason, but these were the, these were the sort of the activists, the dissidents, um, the cold warriors in the West or the, or the, or the anti-communists in the East um, who had fought against communism and who um, had prepared their societies or had then argued in favor of democracy. And many of them in, in Eastern Europe, many of them had very important roles even, or, or had or played roles in, in, in their new democracies and they helped to develop them in, in a couple of cases. Um, and in Western Europe or in the United States, they had cheered on this development and they had very much attached themselves to the ideas and ideals of democracy. And I came to realize a few years ago that not all of them believed any longer in this ideal and idea of democracy, and that includes Americans and, 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 and British and Western Europeans as well as East Europeans. And so I started to ask myself why, um, and in the course of thinking about it, I realized that I knew some of them. Um, some I knew well, some not so well, but they were people who were more or less in my sphere. And as, as Jane said, they are, we're talking about, we're not talking about you know, I'm not just talking about voters or the masses or whatever word like that. I'm talking about the people who were in positions to make anti-democratic or illiberal um, or quasi-authoritarian movements and political parties succeed in, in, in democracies. And they are journalists, they are intellectuals, they are speech writers, they are you know, social media strategists, they are people who make memes, they are, you know, people who think and use ideas. Um, and, and I began to look for historical precedents, you know, were there other moments in history when you'd had this, you'd had people go, this group of people, this group of, not necessarily the leaders and not necessarily, um, you know, the, the voters or the participants, but when you'd had this kind, these kinds of people change their minds um, about what they thought. And of course there are precedents. And so my book looks at some of those precedents and looks at some of the explanations in the past and then looks at some of how this has played out in the present. Um, the word that Jane was using, Clark's, comes from a book um, which was 
called in French the la trahison des Clarks, or the treason of the intellectuals is how it's sometimes translated. Um, and it's about, it was, it was written in France in the first half of the 20th century, and it's about intellectuals of both the left and the right who give up their objectivity and their search for, I don't know, intellectual truth, and they align themselves with political parties for, for partisan reasons. Um, and I, I use that as the starting point. Um, and annoyingly for historians and for political scientists, it's not a book that has one answer or one explanation. There are multiple explanations um, you know, that, that apply to different people at different times. Um, and some of these are personal. You know, there are people for whom um, the society, you know, for in, in, in Poland, for example, there are people for whom the Polish democracy and Polish capitalism that was created after, after 1990 was not personally appealing. They hadn't succeeded in it. They, you know, having been members of the anti-communist opposition, they expected more of it. They thought they would have a bigger role just in the, in the, in the post-communist world. Um, in, in a number of other cases, um, you can find people who were on the right um, or, or the center right in the 1980s, 1990s, who then became disappointed with their own societies, you know, in America or in Britain for other reasons too. Um, I, again, either personal reasons or because they began to find them degenerate or insufficiently, um, you know, their, 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 their right-wing political parties were insufficiently radical. You know, having taken part, having achieved this major success, as they saw it, the collapse of communism, then they were left with the boring job of, you know, knitting Europe together again, bringing together old enemies, you know, expanding the European Union, expanding NATO, um, and, or in the case of, of Eastern European countries, you know, rebuilding the roads and putting up office buildings. And those kinds of tasks that sort of, in, in Poland, it's called positivism, you know, these sort of constructive rebuilding, you know, pulling together was not interesting for a lot of people. Um, and indeed boring. And indeed, some of the politics that were produced were unappealing. You know, it was, you got, you know, mediocrities were elected to office. And the new capitalism didn't necessarily produce heroes. It produced, you know, a lot of corruption. Um, and people began, and there, and there began to be a lot of disappointment with the nature of society. And this, this too has a precedent. You know, people being disappointed with democracy because it involves a lot of victory because it doesn't always produce the best leaders or because it's or because it's unsatisfying morally or because it doesn't produce that sense of you know unity and togetherness and the national greatness that people want from it or, or it doesn't always do that and this disappointment with democracy or disappointment with the reality of democracy led uh, you know a number of people to choose more radical options or to look for um, you know, to, to attach themselves to political movements that would break up this, you know, this kind of, you know, le less interesting, and in some cases, as they said for them, you know, immoral societies. Um, so there are, in the book, the book talks about Poles, it talks about Hungarians, it talks a little bit about Spaniards, it also talks about Americans, and that part of the Republican Party that became you know, genuinely disillusioned with America. You know, the, you know you, and the, one of the people who I focus on in the book is, you know, very famous Fox News presenter, Laura Ingram, who is somebody who has said on the air that, you know, the, the America that we live in now is not the America that we knew or she knew when she was growing up. It's changing in irrevocable ways and in ways that she doesn't like. And if you really believe that, you know, if you believe that your country is, changing in a bad way and has been irrevocably lost and can't be recovered use in normal politics then you begin to look for more radical options and when you look back over history this is where extremism always comes from you know radical disappointment radical despair you know our my country is lost you know the feeling that something is disappearing and we can't get it back and this is in the historically has often led people into into more extreme and more radical directions because there's a certain point after which what's to lose you know if everything is terrible if the country is going downhill if we're losing what it means to be english you know or to be polish 
then smashing it or changing it or radically altering it becomes an option um, uh, in a new way. And so the, so the book looks at some of the psychology of that and, and there are a few people who, who I either I talk to or I write about or I look at um, more carefully who, who, who express or f fulfill these ideas. I mean, the book doesn't have a, um, it doesn't have a solution exactly. I mean, it doesn't argue for, um, you know, specific ways in which we can fix things. Um, it just looks at, tries to look at the mentality of disliking it. What is the, where is the dislike for liberal democracy coming from? How does it echo similar movements in the past or similar ways of thinking in the past? And I hoped that by doing that, I could, um, in particular, I was hoping that the book would be read by people in the center and on the center left and or in the former right, which of which there's a large group of people, and that it would help help people understand what's going on and why and where this radicalism, this extremism is coming from and where this dislike of and uh, of, of democracy is coming from. And I also hope that I would remind people that, and particularly Americans, um, and since there are a lot of Americans on this call, I would remind people that, you know, we have really taken democracy for granted um, in our countries. Um, that we assume that just because we had this success for such a long time and we had many decades of consensus, um, we assumed that it would last forever. Um, and American history had begun to be read by a lot of people as a sort of long string of success. And, you know, you're going from one, one success to the next, you know, constant expansion of the vote, the inclusion of more people, um, an ever growing and ever more democratic society, you know, with that little blip of the civil war in the middle and we can, you know, but of course we can, you know, we can sort of skip over that and move on. And I think that we forgot that, you know, historically most democracies do fail. And the founders of the United States were afraid that democracy would fail. And one of the reasons they wrote the constitution the way they did is that they were reading the histories of ancient Greece and Rome, which, you know, in which people talked about why the Roman Republic failed or why the Athenian democracy failed. And they had that in the front of their heads. And they, they understood the attraction of demagogues, that people will vote for them or will follow them. Um, and that, that, you know, just because you're American or you're born in the United States, just because we've had our democracy has lasted so long, it doesn't mean that we're immune from this disease. Um, and, you know, and the, and the point is that history is, does not move in a progressive line, you know, always onward and upward in the same direction. You know, history is circular and you can go backwards or just as easily as forwards. And anyway, there is no backwards and forwards because, um, because events, you know, events continually unfold. And if you care about the ideals of democracy and you care about maintaining that level playing field and you care about having a well-informed society and you care about rational debate, then it may be that you have to work harder on it than you thought you would have to. In other words, these aren't things that you can just take for granted, you know, that they'll always be there because they always have been, or at least they have been as far back as, as we can remember, you know, in, in recent history. Um, and, you know, certainly Poles and Hungarians, but also British and French and German, and Italian and Spanish Democrats and American Democrats need to, you know, re you know remember, um, you know, remember that you know, democratic institutions need to be renewed, that the democratic spirit needs to be re-invoked and re-inflamed, um, that, you know, liberalism can become boring and stale. Um, and it may also need an, you know, new invocations. It may need to take new forms. And being too attached to the assumptions of the past um, could, you know, can, can lead to the, you know, the, the end of democracy if we're not careful. So that, that's, that's what the book is about. And as I said, it is very, you know, it is my point of view. It's, I talk about people that I happen to know, um, things that I experienced, places, you know, where I lived. Um, and so it doesn't attempt to do, it's not a history of democracy in the 20th century or whatever, like that. Um, but I hope that it would be a starting point for conversations. And I, I think maybe it achieved that. Anyway, that's, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Anne. Uh, I think you're right that the book has prompted uh, a good number of conversations. And I hope that this will 
continue uh, to, to be part of that process. Um, we are now moving into the kind of question discussion period, as Christian pointed out in the beginning. Uh, if you're interested in posing a question, if you could uh, use the raise hand function, that'll put you in the queue. And if you're watching from Facebook, uh, if you can write in uh, to Rachel Wheatley at the American Historical Association with your question, we'll try to get as many as we can. Um, to start us off, uh, Jane, are you interested in posing a question for us? I am. Thank Great. you very much. And thank you, Anne. Um, I, I, I want to, I'm not sure how to phrase this, but it has been occurring to me since the Arab Spring, uh, which I spent some time trying to understand. And what was interesting in the Arab Spring was that a lot of the younger folk who were really good at tearing down government had not only no skill, but no interest in standing up something else. And in fact, I remember being in Cairo and talking to some of the kids. This is before the first election that elected the Muslim Brotherhood which none of them wanted, um, but they didn't vote. The, and talking to these kids who said, well, you know, we're, we're not political. And the same thing is going on to some extent with Black Lives Matter in the States, where a number, Black Lives Matter has not, doesn't have one leader. It doesn't align with a political party, so far as I know. And so my question to you, Anne, is you seem to think that, you know, various groups, you know, we could call those the deep state groups, get disillusioned and then they want something else and then they support authoritarian government. What about how much, it, it, uh, am I possibly right that a lot of these groups get disillusioned and then they f fall away from politics in, entirely? No, so one, I mean, yes, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's an important theme. One of the one of the, you know, when, when people don't find a political avenue to express themselves, you know, then they begin looking for other avenues. And, you know, historically, this is when you get violence, is when mm -hmm. people don't have a legitimate way to express themselves, to address their concerns for justice or for inequality or whatever, whatever the issue is. Um, and, and there is a danger that when, you, when, politi when politics begins to seem stale to people, particularly young people, that they, you know, that they, 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 they look for alternatives. Um, and that's a danger, certainly in the United States. I mean, also, you know, the phenomenon of the revolutionaries who become bored after the revolution or who turn out yeah. not to be administrators of society afterwards is a very old one. I mean, the... Um, you know, the, the people who were able to, as you say, knock, you know, man the barricades and knock down the walls and, and, and join the demonstrations are not necessarily the people afterwards who can do the economic reforms or make the political changes that are necessary to, right. to, to calm people. So, you know, successful revolutions usually have both kinds of people involved. Um, 1989 actually was, in that sense, um, a, you know, a successful revolution, you know, in, in, at least in Central Europe, because there was a class of people, a kind of alternative elite, you know, who included economists and, and, and others who thought already about what kinds of changes had to be made to their societies, and they were ready to make them. And I think that is, that's one of the reasons why it worked as well as it did, in, at least in the 1990s and 2000s. Um, you know, that hasn't been true, that was not true in the Arab world, um, at least not mm -hmm. everywhere, with some exceptions. Um, and, you know, it hasn't been true in other places as well. I mean, you know, the, you just look, look back through history at the fate of numerous revolutions, whether it's the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution, um, and, you, and you can see the same thing. Um, but yes, the skills required for, you know, leading, for, for angry politics, and the skills required for you know, running or fixing or changing the country are not necessarily the same. Sometimes you're lucky and there are some, you know, there have been some great revolutionary leaders or great political leaders who then turned out to be, you know, great administrators as well, but it, it's not always the same. Um, but, but, but your point, your, your, your broader point about the need to um, incorporate people um, to give them a role and give them a way to speak in society is a really important one. Yeah. Uh, and, and when democracies begin to fail when they are no longer able to do that, when people don't mm -hmm. see how the political system can accommodate them anymore. And then you get extremists. 
Thank you. Thank you. Christian Osterman, I believe you have a question. Sure. Thanks, Eric. Um, again, congratulations, uh, Anne, on, on the book. Um, you already, uh, Jane already referenced the, uh, the clerks that you write about that play a key role in, in, your, um, in your book and uh, kind of in exploring what might draw them to a demagogue, what really, I think it goes beyond those clerks. Why are people drawn to demagogues and, um, uh, and, and how that happens? You, and I found this the most, perhaps the most interesting, fascinating part of the book is you draw on uh, Karen Stenner uh, this behavioral economist and, uh, who talks about authoritarian predisposition. An inclination, as I read you, an inclination to favor simplicity, homogeneity, um, order. Um, an idea that I find really, really interesting, uh, partly because I'm writing a biography of Marcus Wolf, the uh, head of East Germany's foreign intelligence, an intellectual, came from an intellectual family in a way, uh, and becomes part of the repressive system of, of the GDR. Um, so thinking about him, I would say there's actually a lot that you need to unpack there, a lot that goes into an authoritarian disposition um, from childhood to traumatic events. And, you know, for example, living through the great purges in the Soviet Union in the 1930s. So my question is, however, a bit more broadly, isn't isn't there some authoritarian predisposition in all of us? Aren't we all at some level drawn mm. to simplicity, yes. need simplicity to organize our lives, our thoughts, our politics? Um, and isn't it that there are events or points, turning points at which some people, um, uh, their desire to the desire for simplicity overwhelms their critical uh, abilities. Because after all, you spend a lot of time, you write about these people, and you spend a lot of time with many of them. They were your friends. And I would sure you would have, you would not have been their friend or probably not been so close to them if they were averse to complexity from the start. So I wonder if you can unpack this, this idea of authoritarian predisposition a bit further. I think that's a just fascinating idea that you really demonstrate through some of the biographical um, narratives that you develop in the book. So I, I wrote about the authoritarian predisposition because it's a very old idea, you know, in the conversation about totalitarianism, it starts with Hannah Arendt, who talks about authoritarian personalities. Um, and then her work inspired a whole series of people to do investigations and to, you know, in the, in the, in the post-war years and to, um, you know, into what is, is there such a thing as an authoritarian? Nobody really came up with a good explanation. Um, and as you know, I mean, because I, I just wrote a big piece in the Atlantic with Ed Marcus Wolf at the beginning. I noticed. Um, you know this story. <laughs> so one of the, and one of the great, you know, mysteries in, in the history of East Germany is that Marcus Wolf, as you know, and as many, some readers, those who read my piece will know, this is an Atlantic cover story a couple of months ago that Marcus Wolf was a, a close friend of his who had almost exactly the same background, came from the same kind of family, East German communists, German communists, grew up in the Soviet Union, came to East Germany after the war, were promoted very early into important jobs. And one of them went on to be Marcus Wolf, the head of the spy agency, and the other one left the country and became an anti-communist historian, and that's Wolfgang Lanard. And when you look at their biographies, it is not immediately obvious as to why one chose one and one the other. Um, and the work of, and there have been a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists and so on who, who, who tried to, to, to define this. And the one who, who I thought was the most interesting was Karen Stenner, who's a very modern and recent you know, writer. Um, and one of the reasons is that she writes about not so much an authoritarian personality um, as an authoritarian predisposition. So it's not that some people are, you know, baked in the bone and just born that way, you know, from, from early childhood, but that some people have it in them somehow, you know, and that given the right circumstances, they'll, you know, they'll want, they'll be in favor of, you know, a strong hand, let's end all this conversation. You know, let's, you know, there are people for whom hierarchy, tradition, 
Um, you know, she also found that it coordinated well with a desire for um, homogeneity, that all these things, um, you know, and, and for some people, they're even triggering events, you know, trauma or moments when um, there's too much confusion or moments of very loud cacophony when there's lots of argument. And you just say enough with all this argument, you know, we just need to stop. Um, and she felt that there were some people who were more likely to be predisposed in that way than others. Mm -hmm. um, but what you're saying is something more interesting, which is that don't we all have it? Um, you know, doesn't everybody have it? And maybe there is a point. I mean, there is a, you know, we all know from the history of, um, even from recent history, you know, if you look at um, societies where there have been terrible civil wars or really a lot of violence, you know, that there's a moment when people really want the violence to stop and they will trade freedom for security and they'll say all right i'll give up a certain amount of my ability to move around or say what i think as long as you if you can make the violence stop and make and make us secure i mean there's been an element of that in some places in the reaction to the coronavirus I mean, was a, there was you know, even this willingness that even in countries like france and italy to say okay we understand you know we'll stay home um, we'll accept the orders of the state to not leave our houses, you know, if we can. And that was a, it was understandable why people did that. I'm not saying it indicated that there's anything wrong with them. But nevertheless, it was a, it was, it was a evidence that people will sacrifice freedom, the ability to move, to make decisions for themselves in exchange for a promise of security. And particularly when people are afraid, um, they'll do that. And that's an extreme example, but there are a lot more everyday examples of it. You know, when people are afraid, when they're anxious, um, when they see things changing very fast, when they feel like their things are out of control. Um, and in a society that is changing as rapidly as ours, you know, is experiencing this um, almost head spinning economic and, right. and informational and technological changes, um, for a lot of people, these are, these are triggering moments. You know, people, people you know, find this to be all too much and they would like it to stop. So I, you know, in, in, in the very broadest sense, yes, everybody, all of us have it in us. All of us will trade freedom from security in extreme circumstances. But, you know, there is a thresh, that threshold is maybe different for different people. Um, and there are quite a lot of people who will, um, you know, who in exchange for, you know, what seems like, you know, not very great guarantees, but who will, who, who do seem to be willing to give things up. Um, you know, there, it may turn out that there are a lot of Americans, for example, for whom it is less important to have a fair election than we thought it was. You know, that we, we assumed that that was something all Americans wanted and accepted, and that the idea, for example, of the president damaging the postal service so that it would be um, difficult to deliver absentee ballots, that we would have assumed most Americans would find that unacceptable. But it may turn out that for some Americans, the threat of, you know, what they see as the radical left coming to power is so great you know, that they will accept even the, this, this damage done to democracy. Um, but we'll see. Um, so, so I would say, I would answer that yes, it's in all of us, but you know, there are two different degrees. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to get a question in here before we open this up. And I want to kind of push you on what I think is a theme or a, a, an argument that you make in the book and in various interviews uh, in which you highlight a transformation of the Republican Party at the end or after the end of the Cold War. And you contrast the optimism of the Reagan years or even what you call the uh, optimistic conservatism of the 1990s to the dark pessimism of Republicans under Trump today. So there's kind of a before and after quality, a good Republican party that has now descended uh, into the party of Trump. Could one make a case that there is more continuity here than you suggest? And so what I'm thinking here is Reagan, who makes a few appearances in the book, um, like many presidents of either political party, stretch the truth. Uh, he played the race card. He launched his 1980 campaign at the Neshoba County Fair in Mississippi uh, with a speech on states' rights, a clear racial signal. 
Uh, he told exaggerated and racially coded stories about welfare queens. His anti-communism um, led him to kind of exaggerate uh, uh, the threat uh, and, and uh, misrepresent what was taking place in Central America and, op and ultimately to, to uh, exchange arms for hostages uh, for his beloved Contras. Um, and one could go on here, or the, the, the optimistic conservatism of the 1990s included Newt Gingrich's scorched earth politics. So granting the political crisis uh, of today being extreme, couldn't one argue that painting the Republican Party of the 80s and 90s in kind of, I guess, golden hues somewhat airbrushes away some of the very themes that you find problematic today? So I, I don't disagree with you at all. I mean, I, the, the Republican Party, um, like the Democratic Party, and we can talk about that if you want, um, <laughs> was and is a cult um, and it contained you know a range of people and it expressed a range of ideas um, and you know even the even the anti-communist movement if that's the right way to write expression to use in the united states also could, had people who were anti-communist for different reasons so it had so some people were anti-communist because I don't know because they were they were interested in realpolitik and there was they wanted to push back against the Russians and some people were anti-communist because they cared about human rights and some people were anti-communist because they were Christians and communism was atheist and very quickly after the fall of communism they all found that they had they didn't have quite as much in common um, as they did but I'm not I'm not disagreeing with you at all I mean there were strains of Reaganism and strains of you know, old-fashioned conservatism and strength in the Republican Party that were ugly in the past and remain ugly now. Um, it's the, but the, but the triumph of a particular form of pessimism and making that of the, as the, the dominant note in the party, you know, that the president, a Republican president is now somebody who excoriates and attacks America and inaugural speech was about America Carnage and the catastrophe of America is such a great contrast to the you know shining whichever Reagan speech you want really you know shining city on the hill or um, American greatness or whatever you know, whichever piece of that of that ideology you want that you have to you know that some some dominant node in the party has shifted you know from um, from from that era to this one and so my you know in my again this is a very thin short book that doesn't have to go into all these. You know, it's, and it's not a book about the Republican Party, um, but but yes, you're right. I mean, you can find the. And in fact, in my book, I look at the. You know, I have a reference to Pat Buchanan, um, who's been saying, you know, for 20 years or more, actually now I think since the early 90s has been saying that, um, you know, the United States is on a catastrophic road to disaster, and you know that's he was one of the first people to use this kind of pessimism in his. And he started it three decades ago, um, and it's you know what we're seeing now is in some ways the triumph of his ideas in the, the Republican Party. So yes, you can find these things in the past. I mean, you know, this isn't the subject of today's conversation. I mean, you can you can also find ugly and extremist notes in you know in the camp of the left or the Democratic Party um, in the past too, if you want to find them. Um, the question is which are you know which ideas triumph and which ones win and lose. And my view is that a, you know, much uglier version of Republicanism, uh, much, um, I, would, I wouldn't even call it conservatism, I don't think it has that much to do with conservatism, um, but a, a much uglier um, political vision, which you can find the roots of, you know, going back to the 50s, um, you know, in, the, in, the, in, the, you know, in all kinds of places. That has now triumphed in a way that, you know, what wouldn't necessarily have predicted 20 years ago. But no, of course you're not wrong. Of course, some of it was there before. Even Thank you. In yeah. Thanks. All right, we're now moving to uh, uh, audience and hands raised. Uh, we have a James Banner. I am allowing you to talk if you would unmute yourself and pose your question. I think I'm unmuted, am I not? You are. Okay. Go Good. Ahead. Uh, Ms. Applebaum, it's nice to see you. Um, I want to follow up on Eric's uh, question. Um, I'm reasonably pessimistic these days, although an optimistic man. And when I want to intensify my pessimism, I turn to three people. I turn to you, to Tim Snyder, and to uh, Masha Gessen. 
um, because I always come away feeling even darker than I feel on my darkest days these days. I mean, she, she makes me really uh, worry, I mean, because I've never seen her smile um, either of, of face or, or intellectually. Tim, because he's, his history is rooted in the darkest uh, periods of, of Western history of the 20th century, and you, because you live among these people, you write about them now, um, and you've written about the Gulag, which is certainly not a happy story. How do you differentiate your kind of pessimism from the other two? Um, how do you distinguish your own thinking about our current problems and crises from Tim and from Masha Gessen? Um, that's a difficult question, actually. Um, partly because, although it's true, I mean, I'm probably sort of genetically pessimistic, and yes, I've been drawn to these very gloomy themes, and I have written about some of the worst periods in, you know, in the 20th century. But I actually now think that it is irresponsible to be pessimist, to be a, a, an active pessimist. Um, you know, it's not fair to younger people. Not fair to people who are in their 20s, for people my age, um, to be pessimistic and to say everything's terrible and it's all finished. Um, because that really closes off possibilities for a younger generation of people to make real changes and to and to live different kinds of lives. Um, my, my, my friend David Trum likes to say that anybody over 50 is naturally pessimistic because when we look ahead, all we can see is, you know, decline and death. Whereas if you're 21, you know, you've got a lot, you know, you, 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 you see the world differently. And it, it would be unfair for older people to impose their, um, their, their, their pessimism on young. So in that sense, I'm not pessimistic. I, um, I do think, um, American idealism and American democracy can be renewed. Um, you know, I think there are there are concrete ways we could change our politics, um, whether from altering the ways we vote or altering the ways we fight politics, or you know, there there are there are things that can be done. It's not hopeless. Um, and maybe um, you know, may, maybe that makes me different a little bit from Tim and Masha. Um, although Tim is. Um, Tim Snyder is someone who I think also believes, T Tim is somebody who believes like me, in fact, I think I have a lot in common with him and that he believes very much in using the past to learn lessons. And uh, I suppose Masha believes that in the same way. She uses her experience of living in the Soviet Union and working in, or her, her understanding of the Soviet Union and um, as, a, as a way of warning Americans. And so, both of them, maybe all three of us, use the lessons from other countries to remind Americans that they're not exceptional, that things that have happened in Russia or have happened in wherever, Poland or Ukraine, or can happen here because they, you know, because that's the nature of that's the nature of politics. But um, but I would I would say that ultimately I I you know I do, I don't believe in pessimism as a philosophy. I think that. Um, we owe it to, as I say, as to, to, to younger people to remain optimistic and to keep working on how to fix things and to keep thinking in this positivist way. Thank you. I am now going to call on Sarah Weinberger. Uh, you are now allowed to talk. Please unmute yourself. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering if you could comment how, on how the changing demographics in the United States and also in the rest of the world are contributing to authoritarianism. I'm particularly interested because in this country, we certainly are having a more authoritarian president, but we're also talking about wanting to focus on federalism, which contradicts that. Um, so those are two different questions. I mean, so de demographic change, and I do talk about this a little bit in the book, um, demographic change historically is one of the things that often provokes or creates kind of moral panics, um, sometimes in, in unexpected ways. So, for example, um, it was the moment when the Jews in Germany began to succeed and assimilate. That was the moment when they provoked this, you know, the, the, the strongest anti-Semitism. So it wasn't when they first arrived in Germany. It was when they began to play a leading role in German society. 
So the, the impression that suddenly there were Jews running things um, was one of the, you know, one of the, um, one of the, I mean, I don't want, I'm, this is oversimplifying, but one of many sources of, of, of Nazi anti-Semitism. Um, and in other times and places, you can see that big demographic changes and the um, arrival of different kinds of people have passed without much comment. I mean, the, you know, after the Yugoslav Wars in the 1990s, there were big, big numbers of refugees appeared, for example, in Hungary, um, with causing no real reaction or no objection. They were assimilated, it was understood they came from a war zone and they were assimilated um, and people moved on. Um, and yet the, um, the specter of refugees arriving from Syria um, more recently was used by Hungarian politicians as a kind of threat. You know, they're coming to destroy our country, they're coming to undermine us, they're coming to destroy Christianity and so on. And so sometimes it's not so much the demographic change, it's how the change is explained and sold to people and whether or not it's used by a politician to, um, to scare people. Um, and in the United States, I mean, you know, look, you can, you know, we have had, uh, you know, a, a, a big wave of immigration. I mean, it's actually been tapering off more recently, but, um, we've had a big wave of immigration. There's a lot of different kinds of people in the United States. And you, for some people, that's a really exciting new change. And it means that they're new and different kinds of Americans and they contribute interesting things to American society. And for some people, it feels like a threat. And there have been some people who have been good politically at translating this, making people feel it's a threat and provoking precisely the kind of authoritarian reaction that we were talking about before. You know, it's one of those... Um, one of the things that sparks people um, to be afraid and to want more security and to want more tradition and to want more things to return to where they were is this specter of demographic change. You know, people like me are disappearing or people like me are having less say or we're losing our status in society or we're losing people who look like me are losing our place. That's very often um, a source of, you know, mass discontent. And it's, you know, kind of unsurprising that we have it. Um, that we have it in America too. Um, you know, I mean, I think the question about, you know, about about federalism is 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 a slightly different one. I'm not sure it's related to the same theme, but certainly demographic change, just like economic change, um, if when it when it's very rapid, can absolutely spark, you know, major counter reactions and has, you know, throughout recent history. Thank you. I am now unmuting Ron Radosh. If you could unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Good. Uh, Anne, hi, Anne. Uh, I was thinking I happened to read the uh, very astute, interesting review two days ago by Ivan Krastev of your book that appeared in Foreign Policy. And he raises the issue that authoritarianism is not an ideology like communism was. And hence, there's a group of people who are now openly rejecting liberalism. And that made me think that the generation I came from, the 60s, 70s, new left, uh, the new left became totally disillusioned with democracy. They, want, they thought, thought America was a sick society that could not be changed for the better. There had to be an actual revolution akin to the Bolshevik revolution uh, for anything to develop. And they literally hated America, everything about it. Uh, now you have a whole group new, of new intellectuals who used to, as you say, be the kind of people, some of whom were at your famous, now famous party in Poland decades ago. Uh, but um, from what I read of them, uh, they too feel there's no hope in American society. You had few examples of this. I, his name slipped in my mind, but the editor of First Things magazine wrote this huge, huge essay, which essentially says, America is finished, and we need a new authoritarian rule to get it back in shape. Patrick Buchanan was one of the first to love Putin. Now a lot of these people love Putin. They also love Orban. They love authoritarianism as the only way to move things forward. Uh, there's Sorab Arami, Amari, who is the Catholic social conservative, now editorial page editor of the New York Post, and he openly is distraught and essentially fed up with American liberalism and thinks we don't need a liberal society anymore. 
we can be saved by authoritarians, which is clear. That's why they love Trump. They see him as a figure who can help move America in that direction. Mm -hmm. I want to know if, uh, you know, I find it very disheartening that some people who think critically have now moved in such an extreme direction. So actually, in my book, there is the, the chapter on the United States is about exactly this. I mean, it starts out with um, quotes and sort of just a little bit of history of, of the far left in America, which was, as you say, radically anti-American and radical wanted revolution, and then goes and points out how some of the same language and the same ideas you can now hear on the far right or on the, on the right, if you, if you want to call it that. Um, and that the chapter is called Prairie Fire, um, and it quotes from a famous, um, you know, kind of famous far left essay that was written in the 60s, um, which was quoted or referred to um, more recently by Steve Bannon. So it, it points out that there's some of the same mood on the far left and the far right now, even though, of course, they would all hate each other. Um, um, so I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you at all. I mean, I think the the impulse, the sort of disgust with liberal democracy, the feeling that institutions are fake, you know, the idea that everybody's purchased and bought up, that all politics is, is, is fiction, you know, these ideas that were once found on the far left are now part of the, part of the culture on the right. Um, you know, not all the right, but part of the right. Um, and, and I think you're absolutely right to make the, um, um, to, to, to make the comparison, and that's you know that's literally what one of the one of the one of the book chapters says. Um, and again, the question of why that happens or how is, you know, there isn't, you know, this is what we've been discussing. I mean, there isn't one answer. There is a there is a host of answers, and the answer is a little bit different for different people. But you know, the the question, you know, the the point is that we have a group of people who are disappointed with America, who are pessimistic about America. Sometimes it's for personal reasons because they feel they haven't, you know, you know, achieved or had the recognition that they deserve. And sometimes it's for political reasons. They feel that America is degenerate or it's, you know, you know, too much demographic change or too much, you can, you know, the wrong kind of economic change. Um, but the, it is this kind of disappointment and disgust that has caused the radicalism you know, of, of a generation ago and is causing it now. Thank you. We have time for one more question. I'm recognizing Katrin Schulteis, if she could unmute herself. Hello? I'm not hearing anything. Rachel Wheatley, is there a problem at which end? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so I wanted, to, if you could talk a little bit about the question of conspiracy theories and how they're amplified today by social media. I mean, uh, conspiracy theories about why my life sucks or why things didn't work out the way they should have are not new at all. But the question of, of of this being, you know, why is all of this happening now? Um, I'm wondering whether you see how big a role you see this, the social media playing in this promoting of explanations for, um, for what's happening in people's lives. Sure, so uh, once again, conspiracy theory and social media are both themes in the book. And yes, I do think that social media has made, it, made a difference. I mean. Conspiracy theories have a really important function for the new right um, because they are used to reduce people's faith in traditional institutions and traditional sources of information. Um, you know, once you believe that the president of the United States is illegitimate, you know, that he is not born in America and he is a false or fake president, um, and once you come to believe that everybody is covering this up you know the media the congress the white house the um the bureaucracy the state department you know once you think that this is all you know everyone in power is is lying to you that there's a fake president then your faith in all those institutions becomes looser and and easier to 
um, you know, and, and, and you know, you, you distance yourself more from them. Um, and this, you know, you can look at numerous countries, and particularly Poland and Hungary, you both are now led by people who came to power using conspiracy theory. Um, and, and, you know, I think, I think we all underestimated birtherism and the influence it had on something like a quarter of the American public and how it prepared them to accept, um, you know, the, the kind of, um, you know, the kind of almost anti-American uh, presidency that 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 Trump has, um, you know, that that, tr that Trump had afterwards. Um, so, so I think they're, you know, really, really important. Um, and I do think that social social media, in a couple of different ways, has. I mean, there's nothing new about conspiracy theory, but it does make them easier to spread and easier to create communities around them. Um, first of all, we know that the way that social media algorithms work. Um, anything that is sensational or creates a lot of anger and emotion spreads faster and attracts more people um, and will be and, and if you've shown any interest in it, you will see more recommendations for it on the algorithms that suggest things to you, um, you know, on Facebook and YouTube. Um, uh, you know, and the, and the, the nature of social media also makes it easier to, for you to you know, for, for almost for new tribes or new political clans to be created around conspiracy theories or around, um, you know, around kind of these false visions. Um, because, you know, you can join a Facebook group and you can kind of get your information from people inside that. Or you can be part of a, um, a kind of social media cluster or bubble in which most of the people who are surrounding you and most of the people you're communicating with also believe in the same conspiracy theory. In other words, um, I do think social media has made it easier both to spread them um, and to reinforce them and, 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 and give them power. So um, it's a, um, you know, it, it, is a, it is a transformative, that has made a really important mark on the politics really of almost every country. I mean, I just don't think it's an accident that we have very similar kinds of political change and particularly this growth of conspiracy theory happening in so many different countries at the same time right now. So it's not just, it cannot be an accident that this kind of politics suddenly working very well in dozens of countries that have nothing else to do with one another. Um, and I do think that social media and specifically, but also the internet more generally, um, has simply made it easier to propagate and promulgate um, and organize people around these, these, these false ideas. Thank you, Anne. Thank you to those who asked questions. And my apologies to those of you still in the queue who we do not have time to get to. And with that, I turn this over to Christian Osterman, who will say some concluding words. Christian? Just to say thank you to Anne Applebaum. Always enriching and interesting to talk to you. Thank you for sharing your insights. The book is Twilight of Democracy. In our next Washington History Seminar session will be not until September 10th and not on a Monday, September 10th at 4 p.m. when Vanderbilt University historian Thomas Schwartz will talk about his new Kissinger biography. Until then, stay safe and sound and we're adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you all.